globalization become a scapegoat. Globalization, you know, is not the main reason for the domestic problems. And if we try to, you know, reduce the globalization, what we have anti-globalization, on the one hand, it will not solve your domestic problem. On the other hand, it make the growth and uh, the development, you know, more challenging. My name is Justin Yifulin. I'm the dean of the Institute of New Structural Economics at the Peking University. The New Structural Economics is trying to, you know, advocate the use of modern economic approach to study the determinant, the determinants of structural and structural evolution uh, in the process of economic development. Because of what I see, the nature of economic development is a process of structural transformation, you know, from agriculture to manufacturing to service-oriented economy, from more traditional technology to more modern technologies. And in this process, you also need to improve the hard infrastructure and institutions. And all those are structural in the economy. And economic development is a process of structural changes. And I advocate using modern economic approach to study the determinants of the structure and the structural evolution. And when I say, you know, the determinant of structural and structural evolution means structure is endogenous. And uh, structural changes is also endogenous. And I don't need to understand what causing the difference in economic structure in country at a different level of development and how to move from low level of productivity structure to higher level productivity structure so you can have the increase in income uh, uh, in a country. So that is the main focus of study of new structural economics. But how do I call them new structural economics? Because the first generation of development economics which emerged after the Second World War is structuralism. And I try to distinguish my studies from the structuralism, so I call new structural economics. Just like in the in, uh, 1960s, when Douglas North started to advocate the use of modern economic studies uh, approach to study institution and uh, institutional changes, he should have referred his study as institutional economics, but because there was an institutional school in the U.S. at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and uh, he wanted to distinguish his approach from the institutional school. So now he referred those type of research as you know, new institutional economics. So new structural economics, the new has the same implication as new institutional economics, but overall, it's you know, the use of modern economic approach to study the determinants of structural and structural transformation in a country's uh, economic development. China, since 1978 to now, the average annual growth rate was about 9.4%. It was a miracle in human history because we never observed such a high growth rate to occur in a country for such a long time. And the possibility for China to achieve that on one dimension, certainly, it was a transformation from a poor agrarian economy to modern manufacturing economies. And in this process, China climbed up the industrial leaders step by step. And that certainly you know, can be explained by the structural transformation as I just described. But on the other hand, China, in this process, also transit from a planned economy to a market economy. And China was able to maintain stability and dynamic economic growth simultaneously, unlike other transition economy, although the intention was similar, to move from planned economy to market economy. But they encountered economic collapse and a stagnation and uh, you know, hit by crisis from time, on, time to time. But China maintains stability and dynamic economic growth. That was also related to 
how China, you know, cope with the distortion that before the transition. Because distortion itself are also endogenous. And the main reason for the distortions uh, in a transition economy was because the country inherited with some kind of industrial structure due to the development strategies before the transition. As I mentioned, economic structure should be endogenous. But we know that after the Second World War, when the country gained in the independence, they wanted to catch up the income country immediately. So they developed all those advanced industries, but they did not have competitive advantages in those kind of sectors. And the firms in those kind of priority industries were not viable. And without the government protection and subsidies, then they cannot survive. In a, a transition economy, they inherited a lot of those kind of non-viable firms. And China was able to maintain stability because China adopted a pragmatic dual track approach. In the transition you know, period, the government continued to provide some kind of necessary protection and subsidies to the older industries to maintain stability. But China also liberalized the entry to the new industry, which are labor intensive, which were consistent with China's comparative advantages, and also facilitate their growth by improving infrastructure in the industrial park or export processing zone or special economic zone. So turn those kind of industry from competitive advantages to national competitiveness quickly. And that was the reason why China can maintain stability and dynamic economic growth. And sometimes this approach also creates condition to remove the protection and subsidies to the older sectors. The main reason the protection and subsidy to the older sectors were essential because they went against China's comparative advantages. But if you have new sectors to grow very rapidly, capital will be accumulated very rapidly, and competitive in a country will change very quickly. So all the sectors will be changing from against the country's comparative advantage to be consistent with the country's comparative advantages. When they are consistent with the country's comparative advantages, protection and subsidies will be not necessary and can be removed. And that is the reason why China can maintain stability and dynamic economic growth and a move not very close to the well-functioning market economy because the government can eliminate the transitory protection and subsidies when the you know, competitive advantages or situation in China changes. Well, I think that during the period of globalization, and we also observe some you know, issues in the US or other high income country. For example, the increase in the income disparity and also you know, the declining of the share of the middle class in the US and other European countries. And those kind of problems causing some kind of social tensions. But we also need to understand the stagnation of the income of the middle class and the enlargement of income disparity. Are they really caused by the globalization or not? And I think a lot of empirical evidence or studies show actually not. The stagnation of the income of the blue class are mainly because of the automation that been adopted in a income country. And the declining shares of the middle class are mainly caused, on the one hand, the concentration of the wealth in the you know, Wall Street by the financial sectors, as well as the concentration of the wealth in the you know, Silicon Valley by those technological genius. And those causing the income disparities. So I would, again, globalization certainly you know, it improve the possibility of trade. And trade is always a win-win for all the countries involved. And in this process, we have some problems. But globalization becomes a scapegoat. Globalization 
you know, it's not the main reason for the domestic problems. And if we try to, you know, reduce the globalization, what we have an anti-globalization, on the one hand, it will not solve your domestic problem. On the other hand, it make the growth and uh, the development in the individual country and globally in a uh, you know, more challenging uh, situation. So I think that, again, just like try to address the issue of trade imbalances. If we really want to improve the problems, we need to understand the true causes of the problem. Otherwise, the action with good intention may you know, bring with bad results.